sorry for uh, the time lag. There's something wrong and it was just not coming up. Uh, so uh, thanks colleagues. And it's nice to see so many colleagues from different parts of the world participating in this session as well. I mean, it's amazing to see the participation. And I mean, Tina, Liz, you know, this is something that we were talking about. The interest in this field is, you know, expanding as we move uh, through this pandemic and, uh, you know, how we want to really keep this as a discipline in the countries. So uh, what I will do today is just to share a couple of insights from uh, work, the work that we are doing. And uh, as the title of the presentation goes, you know, in terms of trying to measure this iceberg. And I'm saying the word trying because it is, you know, it is a trial and error and it is something that is new. It's something that we are all attempting to do in different ways. And this is what we are looking at and how we are looking at it at the moment. So I saw with interest, you know, your slide where you were talking about the different uh, platforms that are available for you in the countries. Uh, and just keep an eye on what you put up there on that screen, because that's something that is going to really be very interesting in this conversation that we will have for the next couple of minutes. So, uh, you know, uh, the reason that we need to, you know, put our focus on the misinformation management area, you know, emerged as the pandemic hit. Uh, and we, and we know that the spread of the misinformation around COVID-19 vaccines has really increased since the global introduction of the vaccines in the countries. And we see how some countries, you know, have been able to handle it. Some countries, uh, it has snowballed into a much bigger thing than what it even started off with. Misinformation not only puts this huge immunization drive that the world is working on. I think it's one of the largest immunization drives in the world, uh, you know, in jeopardy, but also it is hitting on and eroding public trust and confidence in routine immunization. I'm bringing routine immunization into the conversation because the impact we are seeing on routine immunization is also severe. I read somewhere that, you know, we've gone back seven years in terms of routine immunization coverage. And this is huge, you know, because we have been making strides in uh, moving forward on routine immunization and the impact of this misinformation on the COVID vaccine and the roll on effect on routine immunization is already being seen in many countries. And this is scary. Increasing number of vaccine adapters or supporters who were our supporters in the past now have become vaccine hesitant. We are also seeing a new breed of anti-vax communities that are emerging. New breed with new talent, with new ways of attacking the system, attacking the information and all that. So it's, it's a big minefield out there. Building trust and demand in the COVID vaccine as well as other routine immunization services and counteracting this rapid spread of misinformation about the safety of the vaccines or the efficacy of the vaccines has become even more critical now. This is an essential area in to increase overall vaccination coverage and to stop this declining in confidence of vaccines. Because we are what we are so concerned about is the knock-on effect that it will have on root immunization as well. So what I'm going to share with you uh, is a project that UNICEF is working collaboratively with uh, uh, the public goods, public goods project, uh, which is a non, uh, uh, it's a nonprofit in the US and also with the Yale Institute of Public Health. And this is a joint uh, uh, project between UNICEF and these two organizations and we started implementing it now for a while and we just want to share some of that information with you. Basically, the Vaccine Demand Observatory is uh, the main mission of the Vaccine Demand Observatory is uh, to, to take a look at vaccine, uh, you know, uh, hesitancy uh, and to see how we can respond to vaccine hesitancy, uh, you know, in terms of real time, in terms of proper information at the right time 
in the proper manner. The vision is to have a sustainable global network of social analysts or unicorns as you all are calling yourself or infodemic managers uh, supporting the national immunization programs through social listening and partner coordination actively informing demand generation misinformation management vaccine hesitancy and of course the new introductions of new vaccines so in a nutshell it's a big thing big piece to to true off but we're hoping that this would be the ultimate aim of the vaccine demand observatory so as i said it's a collaboration between pgp yale institute of public health and unicef and um, what we've seen in uh, the countries that we are working in, you know, over 100 countries have some form of social listening. So it could be just a very granular method of collecting data and intelligence to a lot more sophisticated multi channel collection of data. Uh, what we are hoping to do is this vaccine demand observatory package at the initial stages. We are implementing it in 16 countries uh, in its total, uh, in, in its entirety, but then we are rapidly increasing uh, the, uh, the footprint uh, in many more countries as we progress. This partnership with uh, uh, Yale also has a component of partnership with Facebook. And we've really seen uh, fantastic success in this partnership because of the access Facebook has uh, to audiences. There are limitations that we are uh, cognizant of or when it comes to access and literacy, but even within that, those limitations, we've been able to achieve quite a lot. So, I mean, if you can look at these numbers, you see 102 UNICEF officers that are participating in this project, 4.4 billion impressions of the material and the messaging that we put out there, 657 million unique users uh, with an average of 6.7 times uh, uh, interaction for each user, 24 million engagements, comments, shares, you know, uh, 14 million website clicks, uh, 6,000 ads that have been managed. But when you look at these numbers, what do you think? Do you think that, you know, is this what we call measuring the iceberg? Does this suffice when it comes to uh, ticking the box for measuring the iceberg? So that's the question that we keep asking ourselves. And that is why we've looked at it in a much more holistic manner, trying to see how do we build the capacity at country level to handle misinformation, to gather misinformation, and then respond to that misinformation. And as byproducts of that work, how does that inform strategy, inform messaging and material production for countries? So the package, the vaccine demand observatory package that we offer the country officers comes in several components or several pillars. And you'll see the different pillars here on this slide. So we do work uh, on a preparatory phase with the countries where we're looking at strategy setting, you know, taking a look at understanding what the needs of the country is, what is the situation that they're currently dealing with, defining the solutions together with the country folk. So it's not about a top-down solution, but working on it together at the country level to try and figure out what will work for them. And then together building that strategy for social listening in the country. So each country, what we've noticed is, is going to be very different and unique depending on their uh, understanding uh, of the situation and the needs of that particular country and taking into cognizance what they currently have at the country level. Then the first main pillar of the whole uh, initiative looks at listening, basically establishing and or strengthening an existing social listening platform that the country is using. So what we've also seen is several countries have a fairly okay uh, social listening platform already created in the country. And they say, okay, we just want you to help us to strengthen this and we want you to improve this. We don't want you to mess around too much with it. Or there are some countries that are saying, we just don't have anything. Uh, we just have someone who's scanning the newspapers or uh, the um, uh, different uh, 
uh, social media channels on a very cursory note and just picking up things that are mentioned about us. So it's a uh, very, 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 very basic system that we have. So we want you to come and set up a platform that we can use in our country. So depending on that need and what is available as a country, uh, we then go into the country to support them on either setting it up or strengthening what they have. Then there's a huge component of capacity building that is built into this whole system. So PGP, that is the public school project together with Yale and UNICEF, we have built a whole set of guidelines, tools, webinars, online training package, uh, uh, which is supplemented with live workshops. And what, what is very key in this whole partnership is this ongoing technical assistance. So country working on a dashboard that has been launched based on the vaccine demand observatory platforms uh, can pick up the phone and call PGP who have standby people who will provide technical assistance, assistance for any issues that they are dealing with, with related to the dashboard. So that is very key because what we've realized is building the capacity at country level will not be enough uh, for them to then take it and run it for a while that handholding will have to take place. Uh, there will be teething problems. There will be new issues that they're dealing with. So we built in this ongoing technical support as a key component of the work that we are providing to the countries. Then of course, you know, there's an interesting pillar which is looking at uh, gamified behavior change interventions. I'll show you what we are talking about in a couple of slides later. And then we have, uh, um, another pillar, which is looking at localized digital content and developing this. So a suite of templates to be tailored for country use, a message bank, vaccine acceptance interventions lab. And that is the part that we are working with Yale uh, to implement. So going into a little more details, pillar one, where we talk about establishing or uh, um, uh, uh, creating that uh, social listening platform in the country offices. So you remember in your slide, I saw that you had put a whole load of uh, platforms that are accessible to you. So this is what these inputs are. So you have your on the, uh, above the line media, like your radio, TV, newspapers, your broadcast news, your news sites, forums, your social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, TikTok, whatever it is that you have access to. Then we also have things like what you mentioned in terms of crowd tangles, signal labs, meltwater, talk walker, and all that. In the mix to that, you can add your Googles and your Twitter partnerships. Uh, and of course, this last bullet, manual investigation is one of my favorites because that is where we go back to the old school way of looking at things. Going to the communities, gathering intelligence from the communities, whether it is sitting under a tree, talking near a well or whatever it is, but you gather that intelligence. And then how do you feed these different types of intelligence that you have gathered on into that platform? And, and the visualization of the platform will then show you basically what these rumors and misinformation that you have collected. The, the last part of this slide, which is on the right-hand side of the slide where it talks about analysis, that is a very key component because that is where human beings actually not automated human beings are looking at the misinformation that has been collected and then grading it in terms of severity so if it is graded as a red um, uh, uh, misinformation or a myth or whatever that means it has to be responded urgently if it's a yellow it's something that you have to keep an eye on to see that it doesn't snowball if it does, then you're expected to respond immediately. And then, of course, the greens are, you know, you can just leave it. That's not something that you need to worry about. Uh, this is a little more detail on the visualization, what happens, uh, a little more information on how it is visualized on the dashboard. Uh, so we create uh, interactive global, regional, and country-level dashboards. Uh, which is easily identify and customer, uh, which could be customized metrics filtered by date. So you can go back uh, to see what was said last month or uh, last week. The visualization tools designed to share real-time vaccination conversations in that targeted area or region or geographical area. 
so just for your information, from October last year to October this year, we've uh, we've been able to analyze about 284 million mentions. Over 150 recommendations have been made as a result of that analysis. 19.6 million conversations have been monitored with this. So uh, looking at, you know, uh, and putting it under different themes of negative attitudes, research or clinical trials, vaccine ingredients, negative health impacts, disease prevalence. So depending on what you want, we can uh, then categorize it under topics basically. Uh, some of the key trends in this whole uh, area of work in, that the Vaccine Demand Observatory offers is, I'm skipping straight to, I mean, yes, the additional coverage of these other uh, platforms like the Twitter Firehose, Reddit, we have access to the entire Twitter Firehose, for example. You know, so this is uh, additional uh, buy-in that has, uh, or uh, what should I say, uh, additional component that is added on to this uh, project. Uh, but what is very key to us is this human analysis. You know, automation analysis basically, you know, identifies when the social media accounts are automated, you know, or bots account for. But here we are looking at real people doing this analysis, identifying when the automation is impacting or engaging in social conversations analyzing connectivity and coordination between the automated accounts. Uh, then it looks at discovering centers of influence within social conversations, uh, audience analysis, emerging na uh, narrative detections. And of course, you know, you have access to your historical uh, look back basically looking at what has been spoken about in the past as well. So this is very, very key in the offer of the Vaccine Demand Observatory. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the traffic light system that we are using. We have direct response, which when it is read, that is absolutely important that we directly address that misinformation. The yellows, it's, pass it's a passive response. We prepare to address it if directly asked and if certain cases consider uh, updating FAQs and in whatever information sheets that you're working on and all that. Otherwise, we just continue to focus on that and then see how it pans out. And the green, of course, you know, we just ignore that for the moment because that's not something that needs our attention. This is a look at what the dashboard, the more the newer dashboard looks like. We're developing it for uh, some of the countries that we're working uh, in. So you have your traffic lights, uh, then you have your topics, and you can basically uh, take a look and see what is existing for your country. Uh, this is, for example, a country level dashboard. It comes up with, you know, uh, when this uh, comment was made three days ago, five days ago, or whatever it is. Is it something that they need to uh, address immediately? And, uh, and the alerts are organized by country. The second pillar is this whole area of capacity building. So we have a, a wealth of guides, misinformation, uh, I mean, guides, material, training packages, training material that, have, that we have access to. In addition to that, we are just discussing with Yale Institute of Public Health to even look at a fellowship program where countries can send people who are involved in this work for a fellowship program to work with the Yale Institute and then build the capacity uh, and get their hands dirty, and then they go back to the countries to use that knowledge that they have gained. We're looking at institutionalizing this uh, uh, training at country level in pre-service and in-service training, for example. So looking at really deep ways of getting this into the countries, into the way that people think and work, and looking at misinformation as an essential uh, area that we need to focus our attention on. Vaccine misinformation management field guide is one of the things that has been done. Messaging guides have been done. There's a whole host of webinars that have uh, that are being that have been that have been launched and will be launched in the future as well. There is an online training package which consists of ten video modules and which is partnered with uh, the a vaccine misinformation playbook that goes hand in hand. That is made available 
then of course the live workshops is a key area uh, or that we focus our attention on because that has yielded a lot of results for us. And the last pillar is that ongoing technical assistance that I told you about. Countries can pick up the phone, call PGP, and then get whatever support they have. They have, what we are also looking at is, you know, the whole area of TORs, capacities, um, uh, countries that we are working in have asked us, you know, so what will it take for us to set up this system? How many people should we have in our unit? Uh, what should be their capacity? Uh, technical capacity, technical knowledge. So we're working with them uh, to, uh, to build that area of work. Uh, so this, I mean, this is just another area of work that we're looking at, uh, but I will go, not go into detail on that. The Vaccine Misinformation Management Field Guide is a, a tool that was developed uh, together with our partners. Uh, as of now, it has been downloaded more than 11,000 times. I've downloaded it 10,990 times, so someone else has, has downloaded it once, I guess. <laughs> so, but uh, basically, it is available in English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Turkish, and Italian. But there may be more languages that gets added on to this as we move into more countries uh, and all that. Then we also have the vaccine messaging guide that has been developed, and this is also very widely used. Uh, these are some of the snapshots of the uh, sessions of um, uh, webinars that we were doing jointly with Saban. Uh, we have the modules that I've spoke about, the playbook and the modules and the misinformation management guide. This is the area that we were talking about in terms of using entertainment education to uh, inoculate users basically to misinformation. So Cranky Uncle is a game that has been produced by uh, a professor in the Monash University. Right now, it has some module that is being used in many schools um, and uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, but what we are now working with uh, the producers of this is to introduce a vaccine a module in, in, uh, through this game. And this is going to basically give the skills to the users of the game to decide for themselves whether it is misinformation, whether they have been taken for a ride, and how do you give them and build the skills through this game to identify misinformation, basically. So it's very interesting technique. And if you want to just go down, go to your uh, Play Store and you can download this game, hdcrankyuncle.com, uh, and just play it, uh, uh, the climate change module. And this is what you will see how it will then get translated to a vaccine module. Uh, and the last part, of course, is the is fair, very related to and relevant to our topic of measuring that iceberg. And this is the project that we're working on with Yale, Facebook, and PGP. And it's looking at, you know, one, uh, an unprecedented level of testing, basically. Uh, looking at putting together behavioral insights, digital using digital marketing lenses, research frameworks, which includes even an RCT uh, for each of the countries that we are working in. And um, uh, so currently we are providing it, uh, we started it in five countries and now we are expanding to another five countries within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and this is in-depth research, which looks at rapid A-B testing of creative material and then able to quickly change and then put the right messages and information out there. What is key in this work with Yale and Facebook is that we're combining market research, you know, tactics and techniques used by the Coca-Colas of this world or the big um, uh, 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 private sector organizations in this uh, world to our social world. So combining these things, so market research based uh, uh, on social listening that includes messaging. A uh, very important aspect is this cultural insights, reference to images and campaigns, colors, you know, how does that work? Then the production team uses this to capture the visuals and the, you know, what works for that country to that context and tailoring the creatives to address that. 
We then move on to, you know, developing the creative team then brings in the expertise in, uh, to, to create this workshop in country material. This is what then is rapid used to rapid A-B testing for format, for message and the messenger. So it's not only about what the, the ad is looking like, but what is the message and who is saying it also uh, was very important in this testing. And we feed in this behavioral insights into this whole thing. So it's a marriage of different areas of work that brings us this fabulous product at the end of the day. Some of the results as we see it uh, from uh, the initial uh, period of the work that we are doing, uh, what we're seeing is modern health systems need tools to listen to, understand and engage with their communities. Yes, we do have this. This is not rocket science. It's not something new, but this is what we are looking at. Vaccine acceptance is based on different levers, which can be targeted in effective messaging. So the levers that we are looking at and, uh, is basically looking at best practices that understands, understands the what is being said who is saying it and how is it being said. And the levers that we are using in these campaigns are thoughts and feelings, attitudes, cognitive biases, trust, social norms, beliefs, experiences and fears, and moral values, ideologies, identity, uh, in, you know, and the worldview. So it's like this Russian doll. So you can, or an onion in that sense, you know, you peel one layer, you go to the next layer, you go to the next layer, and you, you know, you keep peeling it until you get to the core. Uh, there are key, 10 key principles that we are using in our vaccine messaging, basically. So these are the 10 principles that we work on. We are, are not assuming that there is vaccine hesitancy. We're not looking at, you know, uh, to anticipate cognitive shortcuts. We tell stories, we build the trust and use credible communicators. And this is very key. This number four is very key. Some countries that we are working with have seen, you know, a complete shift in their influencers or their credible sources of informants. Uh, those credible sources that they have worked with for a long time have suddenly become not so credible in the eyes of the public. So, and they're seeing a lot of backlash because of the fact that, you know, we don't trust what this guy is saying anymore. You know, he's done this or we are not, uh, he's not an uh, expert in this area of work. So this is very key to be figuring out who your credible communicators are going to be. And connecting with the values has really proven to be very effective. Reminding people why we are vaccinating, reinforcing positive social norms, bursting myths can backfire, but we really need to make sure that we step on that very carefully. You know, communicate vaccination as an aspiration, not as an act, you know, uh, and sell it in a different way. Uh, addressing the audience with uh, vocal vaccine deniers, you know, basically looking at all those areas. Connecting the values is something that I spoke about earlier, you know, value-based messaging has really worked for us in this work. You know, that is framing it in the context may have potential to influence vaccine behavior among those who are vaccine hesitant. So care versus harm, fairness versus cheating, loyalty versus betrayal, you know, authoritative versus submissive, purity versus degradation, liberty versus oppression. And we saw in certain countries, for example, in Ukraine, the work that we did, authoritative really worked because that's what they realized, they uh, empathized with, and they were able to take that message in very positively. But in some countries, you know, this may not, this value may not have been, uh, may not have worked. So it really needs that local context understanding uh, when we're looking at uh, developing this type of material. So, uh, you know, the collaborative innovation that we are talking about is this partnership with we, which we have with all these organizations uh, to basically develop nuanced understanding of country information ecosystems. And this is really, really very key because you go in blind, you're not going to get anywhere. And that local knowledge, local context can be brought in only by your partners on the ground. So working with them from the beginning to build that system up is absolutely essential. Uh, 
and of course, you know, going into the other areas of pre-testing the messaging uh, among the target audience and evaluating the campaigns uh, to quantify real-world impact. Uh, some of what we anticipate as uh, outcomes of this whole project is improved vaccination coverage. I mean, we hope that that's, uh, that's the end goal of what we are all doing. Strengthen the intention to vaccinate as well as improve knowledge, attitudes, and trust. So you, how can we move that person from intention to actual action? Uh, local capability and durable partnerships to apply these learnings at scale. And this is absolutely key. Uh, how this works is we generate the insights. Uh, so data for good analyze, analysis, public, uh, the public Facebook post to generate insights in context to help identify levers for effective messaging. Then we go into designing the targeted content to disseminate via Facebook based on the insights and the local intel and the evidence. Then the messages are tested. Messages are pre-tested for their potential to strengthen vaccine confidence and public demand. And then as the last stage, moving to the last stage, we understand the impact of monitoring vaccination uptake and assessing shifts in knowledge and attitudes. And this is done through the randomized control trial. How the trial work looks like is we have a test and control population of Facebook users in the country. Uh, and then uh, the test group gets the Facebook ads, they deliver polls to this group, and then the analysis or the brand lift is then done. So this is the, I mean, very granular way of looking at it. What we have done so far is we've worked in five countries, Kenya, India, Pakistan, Philippines, and the Ukraine. They've tested, uh, designed 33 campaigns, launched 27 out of them, add credits given to uh, run this test from uh, um, you know, Facebook uh, through UNICEF uh, amounts to about $650,000 worth of ad credits in that first phase. Tens of millions of Facebook users reached with strategic messaging and content. Uh, some of uh, outputs from the test campaigns, 1.4 billion impressions with an average reach of seven of about 7.5 million to 34 million. The, the Variance here is depending on the country and the size of the country. Uh, that's why the average is, uh, you know, so diverse. Uh, a significant recall and positive shifts in attitudes towards the vaccines and 3.75 million clicks for additional vaccination resources. And this is also very key. So for the mere fact that people are actually clicking and trying to, to find more information is a very good sign that they really want to, to improve their knowledge uh, in this area some examples of the material that was used in the different countries. Uh, and one of the, uh, learn, some of the learnings is local engagement being critical to ensure content resonates with the audience. Mix of images and illustrations were very well uh, accepted. Content uh, was tested in multiple languages. And what came out strongly is that local languages are more effective in engaging audiences. Uh, when we uh, did uh, when rely on social listening, local intelligence, and behavior science. So this is key. A significant recall achieved across the various uh, settings. Value-based campaigns shifted attitudes towards vaccine confidence. Many users clicked through for additional resources in response to it. So it's, it, there is a lot more uh, life in the campaign when uh, more information is being sought. Uh, and what we learned, Again, there's no amount of emphasis that you can put on this partnership in terms of not only the global partnership, but the partnership at the country level with the country teams, with the Ministry of Health and working together as a team at that level. Language seems to matter a huge amount, uh, though sometimes some of the countries that we worked in had huge uh, base of uh, users who were comfortable with English, but the moment you had local language content, the engagement was higher. Value-based messaging shifts attitudes. We saw that. And the context is key for moving the needle. This is another um, uh, slide that I just wanted to share before I leave is, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact 
that it doesn't matter where you're getting your data from. And what the two key things that I would like to leave with you and for you to think about is the need to use multiple sources. Now you see here in this slide, Pakistan used almost 13 sources. And the sources ranged from research, from uh, uh, looking at uh, CRAs, the uh, community rapid assessments, observational surveys, to the keyhole social media sentiment analysis, helpline, feedback that you get uh, from journalists and repositories. So you have to make, be able to bring all that together. The other one is the thinking that social uh, listening is not about Facebook listening. It's not about digital listening only. Social listening is about listening to what the people say. So whether you're gathering the information sitting under a tree and talking to the elders, or you are looking at Facebook and trying to gather uh, a trend in narrative, it all falls under social listening. So it's very key that we don't um, you know, put ourselves at the risk of only looking at that audience that has access to the digital platforms, but we make sure that we have access to what people say and think from the other platforms, people who are marginalized, people who have no access, but who still have a voice. So this is from Pakistan, and this is again from Nepal. Again, you can see how the different sources helped the response at the country level. So whether it's radio, whether it's the hotline, the community volunteers, whether it's TV, or the community interactions that they had, or the social media platforms. And that brought me to the end of my presentation. So.